I was recently in Palo Alto, in at Stanford, and it was a beauty parade of those developing um, M Health applications. And they all had beautiful PowerPoint decks, and they had a whole room of venture capitalists with lots of money to spend. And it was really interesting to look at the dynamic. It was so different from medical meetings. But it seemed to me that if you could sell your idea to somebody, that was all they were really interested in. They weren't terribly interested in implementation or the effect on patients or welfare or the healthcare system. So it struck me that they're very different. And when I was flying from London to Nice last night, the person next to me was a venture capitalist. So I asked her, how do you decide what's going to work? Where should you put your money? And we had a very interesting discussion, which I might share with you over coffee, because I'm not going to talk about what she said now. What I am going to tell you, though, is a kind of personal journey through remote monitoring for heart failure specifically, where I started with huge enthusiasm. I'm probably now at the point where I'm hugely uh, against general adoption of this, and probably in two years' time I'll be in a more reasonable position because it is a journey in technologies. You usually have it's the best thing ever to it's the worst thing ever, and then it comes back to a more reasonable position. So I work with lots of different companies all around the world in this area, and of course there's huge potential, but I think for the ESC we have to decide where this is going and what kind of level of evidence we need before we change, it, change things, because it's organisationally complex to change things every few years if it doesn't actually translate into benefit. And of course we all agree um, with Dr. Sancho that we will have to do things differently and we already do things differently and cardiology is very technology friendly as we all know. And of course I had to put this slide in about the European Commission just to let you know I did not vote for Brexit. But you know, now it's happening, we'll have to make the best of it. So the patient journey is complex, so I think you can't extrapolate from a single disease state to another. There's huge variation between that. One model does not fit. So this is heart failure, for example, where actually you may have long periods of stability, but then a lot of instability where you're trying to restabilize a complex syndrome. So some disease areas lend themselves more easily to demonstration of value. Remote monitoring, we are there already, of course. Telephoning a patient after discharge from hospital is remote monitoring, but it's not usually called that. It can be very effective, very inexpensive. We have standalone equipment, and 10 years ago there was a huge rash of different equipment um, put out there. And then, of course, we implant very high-tech devices for therapeutic reasons, and they can give us for free lots more data as well. But the real problem is making sense of the data. It's not getting the data. It's interpreting it, making sense, and making sure we make better decisions, not just more decisions. So that is where the value proposition has to come in. Anything you can think of can now be measured by clever engineers. Anything you can think of can be telemetered accurately back to somewhere. Anywhere you, anything you think of can be looked at on the cloud from anywhere. I can monitor the pulmonary artery pressure in some of my heart failure patients from Hawaii, from Manila, from Nice. It's not difficult to do. We're already there in terms of the potential. The challenge, of course, is does it work meaningfully? And of course, the rationale, just for those of you that are not clinicians, is one, you can pick up earlier deterioration, intervene and restabilize. But more importantly, probably, is you upskill individuals living with a chronic condition to actually more expertly manage themselves. And ultimately, we want to cut out the nasty, expensive doctors. Well, that's the way the policy direction is going. So lots of technologies, I've not got time to go into all of them, but you can see they can be as basic as a person using their television with monitors. You can have implanted systems and then only monitoring only systems put in specifically for that purpose. But I think the need that we have in the clinical community and probably also in the reimbursement community is it looks nice, everybody likes it, it seems sexy, but does it actually make a difference and who is going to pay for it? at the end of the day. So a lot of the large insurance companies are happy to go along with this, provided you can demonstrate the value. And of course, I'm not going to go through the details of this, but the way we as clinicians think about it is we start doing small studies, we meta-analyze these to death and come up with probably unrealistic estimates. The initial estimates were wildly optimistic in very small published studies of using just standalone type systems or even telephone monitoring. So here you can see all-cause mortality down by 34% uh, 
hospitalization down by 20 percent. You know, so it all looks very impressive. No heterogeneity in the studies. They're all saying the same thing. So you might think that's enough evidence. And a lot of venture capitalists would be very encouraged by that. Clinical community is slightly more cynical as they've been here before. Then we move into larger scale studies. All of these have been neutral. This is a big study, TeleHF in the US. Maybe it wasn't what we would think of telemonitoring failed to demonstrate any difference in outcome for the patients. Big disappointment. Now you might say the Americans weren't actually using the technology properly, weren't very compliant, lots of them didn't even use the system once. So we moved to Germany where there's high compliance with the system and actually there, and Stefan Anker sitting at the front was closely involved in this study in Friedrich Kohler, and they also failed to demonstrate a difference in outcome in that more tightly controlled system and then the Americans, again, let's have another shot at it. We'll do it in California where the sun always shines and where everybody's uber bright. And they also, God, you're a hard audience actually. That was a joke, by the way. Anyway, <laughs> this is the impact at all. No impact on outcome from a large Californian academic health center type study, very well run. So a bit disappointing. Yes, you can get all of the data, but it didn't translate into better outcome for patients at the current way that we do that. So why don't we move to implanted systems? Much more high tech, many, many more data streams. And you can see here a patient with the blue line there being admitted to hospital. With the eye of faith, you can see that things were going in the wrong direction, multiple parameters for quite some time. Maybe you would be able to pick this up. We did a study and we did change healthcare utilization. This was using just one parameter, intrathoracic impedance. We increased heart failure hospitalization by 79% unlikely to be due to chance. Because if you alarm people and the patients and the physicians, the default is to do something. So here's a technology, made a difference, wrong direction. So that wasn't so good, but we learned from that. Don't put all your money on one data stream. But then of course, how do you present multiple data streams to a person? I mean, what kind of learning do you have to have behind that? What kind of algorithm um, to process it correctly? So a lot of the work is now about developing those algorithms and trying to identify it more easily in a traffic light system. But often it ends up like this, with lots of things going in different directions, some looking alarming, some not. What do you make of that? Quite difficult to interpret. And various studies have been done. Meta-analysis suggests no difference in mortality from these studies. No difference in hospitalization, but a change in the pattern of healthcare to make it more regular rather than just reacting to emergencies. So potentially from the patient's perspective might be nice, but small studies, the average size of patients in this, only 117 in these studies. So we go on to larger studies. This is the only one that's really been positive and run out of Leipzig the in-time study, with almost a biologically implausible effect on mortality that's never been explained, but is held up as being a good example, which is good, but unfortunately, there's many more examples where there's a neutral effect. This is the most recent study, and forgive me, it's my study, so it's top of my mind, five years of work, and nine hospitals, the world's largest study in this area, um, of 1,650 patients, lot of English hospitals there involved in the study looking for changes in what clinicians consider important outcomes, mortality, cardiovascular hospitalizations, lots of patients going into that. Well treated though, and that's a problem in trials. The control arm is actually very well treated and quite difficult to demonstrate improvement on very well treated patients with conventional good drugs and devices. This is what we paid all those millions of pounds in five years of work, a hazard ratio of 1.01. .01. Could you get any closer to one? I'm not sure about it. <laughs> and that's for our primary endpoint. Mortality, hmm. Unplanned cardiovascular hospitalization, hmm. Other direction of anything. No significant difference in any of the secondary endpoints or in any of the baseline characteristics. So very deeply disappointing. So we then move on to, well, let's use something even cleverer that we implant only for monitoring. It can give us pulmonary artery pressure, a new therapeutic target. And of course, we can now do this. The technology is there. Um, slightly overpriced if you ask me, but it's there. You can implant it in your patients and monitor it very closely. 
They've shown in one trial of only 550 patients in the States impressive benefit in hospitalization. But of course, in the States, hospitalizations charge $20,000, $30,000 for a heart failure admission. In Europe, it's three or 4,000 euros at most. So it's a very different equation to demonstrate value. Last week, another study called Laptop left atrial pressure monitoring a bit, bit more dangerous for the patients and actually stopped because of futility. And they redefined their endpoint. It was all a bit complicated and messy, but certainly the primary endpoint was not hit when you looked at heart failure and heart failure related. But if you just looked at heart failure, perhaps some signal of benefit. So the noise is high. The evidence is not that overwhelming. And it's not really meant a really strong move into this area. And I think probably that's appropriate. You do not want to completely redesign a system if you can't demonstrate extra value. So I think that's where the clinical community is. We're used to seeing large trials. We want to see difference in outcome you can pick up. And when we don't, we then are always set with the scene. We like the technology. We like the policy direction. But convince us. What kind of evidence convinces us as clinicians? What evidence convinces policymakers, reimbursement authorities? That's part of the discussion um, today. But ultimately, I think we all believe that the patient, the consumer with multiple conditions will use data streams to help inform them and only actually involve medically or nursing trained people when appropriate and when necessary. So that will be the model for the future. But we do need evidence for this rather than just a philosophical change. Healthcare Team 2020, this is my team at the Brompton in London. And this is where I wonder if where we're going. So just as um, the European Commission has said, it's about changing wording from patients to consumers to active rather than passive. It's about um, professionals being comfortable with data streams that they don't generate? How do we use the technology to support care, not replace it? And of course, how do we upskill our workforce to be able to deal with this and realize the challenges and move forward so that they're not always seen as being the last people in the room to say, yes, I like this. And that, I think, is the challenge for the future. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.